Hey folks, welcome to chapter two of my Certified Specialist Wines 30 Day Study Sprint. Um, today we'll be covering the topic of wine faults. Uh, before I dive into wine faults, a brief introduction to myself. My name is Hans. I have been an enthusiastic wine drinker since I was 17 years old. Uh, however, my formal wine education started in 2020 to really make something of my drinking habits, especially during COVID. I do not personally work in the wine industry. However, I am the WSET Levels 2 and 3 certified, and I am currently working on my WSET Diploma course. Uh, some of the questions that may come out during exams and you will get to learn over this particular recording is, what's a wine fault that smells like burnt matches? What's a substance that can smell like onions or garlic? And so on and so forth. Um, the topic on wine faults can be a little bit controversial. And the reason for that is too much of almost anything is a fault. And there is a bit of personal taste and preference that comes into play over here. Um, often wine faults are caused by winemaking errors, improper storage, or sometimes just bad luck. And it creates unpleasant taste and aromas which some of us will call faults. Now, in smaller doses, some of these faults could be considered pretty desirable. For example, bread, which produces a kind of barnyardy, animalistic notes that many of us enjoy. And sometimes wine made in the natural way, natural is in uh, quotations, that's because, you know, how natural is wine really still made by humans? But that said, um, it's usually when we think about natural wines, we really mean low intervention wines. And um, that could be made in a way that many others could consider faulty. So really want to call out that wine faults uh, in the real world is something that could be quite controversial and subjective. But for the purposes of this particular course, uh, there are a few key wine faults to learn. And please re remember these as faults and not let our personal opinions cloud it too much. Now, the first wine fault is pretty universal. I think pretty much all of us agree that this is a fault, and that's corked wine. Um, the chemical responsible for corked wine is called TCA. And it creates this musty, moldy, wet cardboard kind of flavor. It's actually formed by a mold that's found naturally in cork and in wine making instruments or just in the winery, on the walls and all of that stuff. Uh, this mold then creates a chemical called TCA, which leaches out of the cork into the wine. At lower doses, the wine actually just tastes less flavorful and at high doses, that's when you get a wet cardboard taste. Now, what's really interesting is that um, most wine consumers, and including myself, find it pretty challenging to detect whether a wine is corked or not. Because as I said, at lower doses, it just tastes less flavorful. How could you tell that maybe this to you, especially if you only had the wine once or twice, you might think, hey, this is just a bad wine. Uh, although what really could be the case is that it's been affected by cork taint. So I definitely found myself opening two bottles of the same wine before because I suspected the first wine to be corked and only to be proven wrong. I just didn't like the wine. So that does happen. Um, as mentioned earlier, TCA can really be found in any part of a winery's environment and it's very persistent. And that means that once TCA is out there, it can find itself into many bottles of wine. Recent technology, for example, technical corks, can reduce the incidence of cork taint. Uh, you might ask what a technical cork is. That's beyond the scope of today. But if you look at the picture, you will see this particular cork in the foreground. Life is too short. And if you look closely, you see that um, the cork is a composite of a lot of small little flaky pieces. 
that's been this adhesive actually binding it together that's like a technical part it's made in a way that sometimes to guarantee quality of the carp over the years uh, it's steam clean there's lots of chemical treatments to make sure it works for all variety of purposes uh, and these corks tend to be more resistant to cork tape while if you see the cork in the background you have more natural cork those that are kind of plain you know single piece corks although these recent in recent years also have been clean and chemically treated such that you can reduce cork taint uh current reports kind of say that cork taints affect one to eight percent of wine produced which is a lot right that means if you're drinking 10 bottles of wine it's likely you bumped into a bottle of cork wine but i think for me you know i might be drinking more than 100 bottles of wine a year sometimes hundreds and it's really hard to tell again whether that bottle of wine unless it's in high dosage is corked or it's just uh, a bad bottle of wine really moving on to the next fault sulfur compounds so sulfur dioxide is used as a preservative but how too much of it produces smell like burnt matches personally i've never encountered this fault before um the more acidic the wine low ph the more prominent the so2 would smell so2 means sulfur dioxide the next sulfur compound I want to talk about is hydrogen sulfide, H2S. So when a sulfur-rich wine sits too long without oxygen, uh, and this could be a winemaking choice, it may develop a set of rotten eggs. Um, this is higher, has a higher potential to happen in bottles with screw caps, uh, especially the older screw caps, because if we wind back the clock 20 years ago, most screw caps were not made to allow any oxygen to seep through although recently there are screw caps that allow a certain amount of oxygen to go through and you can choose the screw cap you want to do that but yeah in the past these screw cap bottles are more susceptible to this rotten egg hydrogen sulfide kind of fault next up we have another sulfur compound which is mercaptan i'm not even sure whether i'm pronouncing that right uh this is really a combination between sulfur and ethanol uh to form that and the smell smells like garlic or onions again this is not something i've encountered in real life um next up this part could be rather common uh in terms of uh like rotten wines this really happens quite often um these are bacteria odors caused by lactic bacteria and acetobacter so while most bacteria cannot survive fermentation because of the alcohol that's being produced but lactic bacteria and acetobacter are some of the main exceptions here and the off odors that kind of produce like vinegar smell i'm sure we've, we've smelled this before in wines if you have opened enough uh butyric acid which is the odor of rancid butter and lactic acid and too much of it right smells like almost like goldish and i know i mentioned in the previous class that uh lactic acid uh in small quantities is a good thing because it's formed by metal lactic fermentation but too much of it is bad um other off odors produced by bacteria include things like ethyl acetate which smells like nail polish remover and interestingly geranium which is a smell resembling geranium leaves that could also be caused by bacteria. Now, you may think geranium, it's a very nice smell, isn't it? But uh, again, too much of it is bad. Some other odors uh, are as follows. You've got brett, which is a kind of yeast, uh, Britannomyces, and it can infect a wine, introducing some of these characteristic banya flavors. Many folks actually enjoy a mild amount of bread. You can find a lot of these bratty wines, for example, in Rhone and certain parts of Burgundy, for example, uh, and even in the Loire. Uh, but some, many people consider this a fault, no matter what levels. So I definitely have friends, when I open a bottle of wine that has a bit of bread, and I'm like, wow, this is really charming. And they say, oh, this is horrible. So, although in most cases, if it's a light amount, that brattishness kind of fades as the night goes on. Another fault is greenness, and it's kind of like the odor of green leaves due to unripe grapes. 
Uh, oxidization. Now, this is another one of those quite uh, controversial ones. Uh, it's subjective. Some people like it. Uh, actually, same thing with the greenness. Some people really like the, for example, you know, when you have a Cabernet Franc from the Loire Valley, a lot of it is this very strong green notes to, because it's kind of underripe. Um, again, many of us like it. But back to oxidation. So oxygen from the air will react with phenols in the wine to form aldehydes, and it creates a nutty caramelized odor, which is most commonly associated with phenol sherry. Or it could be madurized, which is really named after Madeira, which is uh, when you get this cooked or baked odor due to exposure to heat. Um, some other odors include moldiness, which is generally a bad thing. I, uh, it would be interesting to see who enjoys that. Or rubberiness, which is caused by low acid wines or excessive sulfur again. Um, you also got stagnant, which is stale water odor. I haven't experienced that one myself, so I'm not entirely sure, but it's covered in the syllabus. Uh, and then you've got staminess, which is the kind of grape stammy flavor. Again, that's really a personal preferences, but uh, for the sake of the class, we should consider it a fault. Uh, then you've got wet cardboard, definitely a uh, fault, uh, and eastiness, which is again, this is a very controversial uh, subjective thing. It's a pronounced odor of east. Now, in case you're wondering how does yeast smell like, you can just go buy some baker's yeast and open the bottle and smell it. Or um, it's really this very strong breadiness and almost musty breadiness that um, is the yeastiness. It's iconic taste found in champagne and I know friends who absolutely hate champagne because of that. Uh, and finally you've got reductiveness. This is smell struck matches garlic, garlic cut cabbage and it's caused by winemaking that is very low oxygen. There are some very famous wines in the world that's made in a very reductive way. So again, this is highly subjective. Um, just want to wrap up this se section by looking at some of the other exam questions that might occur. Um, I'll pause here for a while just for you guys to check it out and hope you are able to answer that. Um, with that, um, to the end of this particular topic. Uh, again, if you have questions or suggestions, please reach out to me at hans at glassofhans.com. And I look forward to seeing you at chapter three.